Hi, and welcome to the RoboHub podcast. Today, we'll be hearing from Suma Reddy, CEO of Future Acres, a company focused on creating smart tools to reduce labor demand and increase efficiency in farming. Labor is a major part of the cost of all agricultural products in the US and many other countries. Future Acres has identified opportunities to increase efficiency and reduce labour costs using smart tools and autonomous navigation for harvesting and crop transportation. Our interviewer Kate speaks with Suma about their harvest companion robot Carrie, its current impact and future directions of the company. Hello, welcome to RoboHub. Would you please introduce yourself? Hi, uh, Kate. My name is Suma. I am the co-founder and CEO of Future Acres. Welcome to the show, Suma. Can you tell us more about what led you to find Future Acres? Sure. Um, so, you know, first, uh, Future Acres, what it is, is we um, are a company that's building advanced uh, mobility and AI solutions for farms, uh, starting with Carry, an autonomous harvest companion that increases production efficiency, farm worker safety, and provides real-time data and analytics. Um, so it's been a meandering journey to get here. Uh, my first gig was actually in the Peace Corps in Mali. So I've really always been interested in sort of resources, environment, impact, um, and agriculture. From there, you know, hopped over to India, uh, working with farms in the microfinance field for a couple of years, my first unicorn uh, startup. Um, and post that, have really focused on building companies as an entrepreneur uh, at the intersection in, of climate and uh, agricultural technology. So anaerobic digestion, organic waste to energy. Um, after that, really focus on vertical farming and now the wonderful world of um, specialty crops and robotics. Wow, it's very fascinating background, very diverse experiences. Thank you. Could you tell us more about the exact goals that Future Acres is trying to solve? Yeah. Um, so for us, you know, when we think about the major problem in, the, in our mission, really, as a company, you know, we think about this fact, right? You know, in, in not a, a long time from now, we're going to reach a, a population of 10 billion people and we'll need to increase our production, um, food production by 50 percent while reducing our emissions by 75 percent and using no more land. And so agriculture in, in that vein, right, is really important. And one of the challenges um, to, uh, really around food production is people and labor. And so we're seeing this 20% labor shortage um, in a lot of uh, farms. And so what that means is 20% less crops that are harvested, 20% less revenue for the farms, and ultimately 20% less food that could be shipped to our grocery stores. So... On top of that, we also, you know, look at the inefficiencies um, with sort of this this wonderful world of, of outdoor farming. Uh, for example, you know, the wheelbarrow um, in specialty crop farming. You know, a farm worker will spend thirty percent of their day um, hauling hundreds of pounds of crops across uh, across fields and farms. And in our research, we found that we found that. Um, Actually, the wheelbarrow was invented, I believe, in 231 uh, CE in China, uh, and we still use that same wheelbarrow today. Uh, so we, we figured out, you know, like, what is an intelligent transport solution um, for us to uh, basically bring, you know, uh, solve that piece of the puzzle. I see. Fascinating. So what is your current solution or current technology? that yeah. your company provides to solve this piece of the puzzle? So we call our solution Carry, um, and it's essentially the robotic autonomous harvest companion and pick a smart wheelbarrow. And so how they work together um, for a farm worker is that if the farm worker is, say, picking table grapes um, on a farm, they have the pick or their smart wheelbarrow right next to them. They plop those, you know, eventually 200 pounds of grapes on that wheelbarrow, uh, you know, we have load sensors on there so that uh, automatically the fleet of carries at the beginning of farm is alerted uh, that it's time to go pick up those grapes. And so one of the carries will travel autonomously uh, to the farm worker and the wheelbarrow 
um, load up with those crops and then return back to what's called the sorting station um, where packing occurs. And so that cycle uh, continu is continually uh, repeated. So uh, intelligent transport is, is really how we think about it. I see. So the key features include like autonomous navigation, um, as well as, um, did you mention also pick up from the wheelbarrow directly from the farm workers or yeah, is there so, a human companion at that point? Yeah. So um, it, we think of it as sort of a collaborative robot, right? Um, mm -hmm. So there isn't right now, it, though it is considered a future feature set, uh, the grapes are manually offloaded from, from the wheelbarrow. But in terms of features, um, you're exactly right. The autonomous navigation um, is the primary primary feature. Um, the safety of the unit. This is really important, you know, with anything robotics and especially outdoor agriculture. So how are we building safety mechanisms? Um, the third is, you know, how is it powered, right? So batteries um, and keeping it, you know, clean clean energy. Uh, the fourth actually is what, the controller. So we've built in a predictive platform because when we think about the future of, of farming, um, there is going to be swarms of, of little robots uh, for on many of these farms. And so when you think about a lift, right, and how does it optimize, you know, where to go and when to go and those efficiencies, um, we're building the same type of uh, capabilities. I see. Cool. I guess let's get into each of those a little bit more. What are the exact safety features and what are the main considerations when you were designing the product? Yeah, so um, when we think about safety, uh, we also correlate it to robustness. Uh, so for mm -hmm. agriculture, as you can imagine, and especially in California, uh, in this era of climate change, uh, temperatures are getting hotter and hotter. Uh, so one, we had to build a robust vehicle and a robust device uh, because early, early on when we did testing or just 3D printing parts, uh, we actually had a part that, that melted. Um, and so, so really designing uh, for, for the, the hot climate that we see in California during harvest season is really, really important. Um, on the safety side, uh, it's things like even having bumpers, right? Uh, um, and being able to navigate uh, around people. So for example, the carry, if you were standing right in front of it, um, it will stop uh, and make sure not to run into you. So pretty basic stuff, but really, really important uh, because this is something that works alongside farm workers. Yeah, totally makes sense. And in terms of the power, how do you maximize the efficiency and how long can each uh, carry robot last yeah. operating? So it's really important um, that these systems last the full full day. So that's how we think okay. about um, our power, right? And, and, and the life of uh, it during, during operation. So lasting a whole day um, and really swappable batteries um, are how, how we're thinking about it right now. Uh, but as you can imagine, you know, there, there's a lot of potential for things like solar charged battery stations, mm -hmm. um, yeah. features like that, that can optimize efficiency over time. I see. And the, the solar charged um, and battery stations, is that on the current carry robot or is it something that's uh, upcoming or also dependent on the environment the robot is working in? Yeah, I would say it's, uh, it's in our roadmap. So not at the current iteration. I see. Yeah, that makes sense. What kind of feedback have you received from the farm workers? Does it take some time for adoption of such technology or was so we, it very well received immediately? Yeah, it's a little bit of both. Um, so one of the challenges um, and opportunities we've seen in, in, in farming and agriculture is it's a very traditional industry. Um, and the methodologies and how things are done hasn't changed uh, much in hundreds and years, sometimes even thousands. And so uh, talking about innovation and technology um, was a pretty exciting opportunity, but I think it's our responsibility as technologists is to set expectations in the right way. And so what we've seen in the past is that sometimes there is 
over promising and under delivering uh, with agricultural technologies. And so, you know, for us, that's a really important value and principle is that everything we promise we can uh, deliver to our farms. So I say that because now, you know, we, we had a big demo in October with one of our main partners is, you know, setting expectations in the right way, um, communicating a lot about what this technology can do and what it cannot do. Um, and so the, the response was really, really positive. Um, you know, there's, there's sort of the owners and managers who run the farm and there's the farm workers, right? So we think about our users in, in two ways. And the first thing was, is this easy to deploy, right? Does it have, and so for us, plug and play deployment is a really important piece of our feature set. Um, the second is, does the productive planning work? Um, and, you know, absolutely it does. And then three, how are we setting the groundwork um, for these real-time data and analytics? Um, and that's really, really exciting when you think about the future of farming and how data and analytics and precision agriculture are going to come together. Um, yeah, and the, and the fourth is really is, like, is the impact on farm workers. Um, you know, increasing the ease of farm workers is really important um, for as, as a mission for us. And so it's pretty simple. Um, if you can save two hours of a day of, of a farm worker hauling hundreds of pounds of, of grapes or any other crops across farmland, um, it does make their job easier. So, so to be frank, if you ask the question like, oh, you know, is this better? You know, how is it better? It's a very much a like, duh, yeah, like I'm not lugging heavy stuff, right, anymore, and that mm -hmm. solves for that. Cool, yeah. Could you elaborate a bit more on the plug and play aspects of it? Is there, I imagine, that, oh, there, is there yeah, any I, required, or do you need the specific details from the farm to get yeah, the device Yeah, that's started? a bit um, proprietary um, okay. as, a, as a feature set. I see, that makes sense. And in terms of the data and analytics, I know that would be a huge asset for the farm as well. What are some of the key interests and what do farm workers want to learn and that could be acquired from the carry robot? Yeah. So yeah, this has been a really interesting problem to solve. Um, right now, what we see is that most farms um, you know, are making seven figure decisions on their farms without any data. So that could be around people, it could be around, you know, resources, land, water, pesticides, chemicals, right? All of that management is, is done with very, very limited amounts of data. And this is what we have heard um, directly from farmers themselves. And so for them, um, you know, uh, the usable data for us that we think about is what is the first problem sets that are feasible and that we can solve. And so uh, one, data on the fleets themselves, right? Um, the farm operators and managers want to know where are these fleets, like how are they operating? Um, the second is around um, the farm workers themselves, right? Uh, right now, pay is integrated uh, into a payroll system. And so, so being able to just kind of calculate, oh, this many pounds per location or this many pounds per hour um, is really helpful. And, and then yields, uh, yields is really important. So if we can do yield per varietal, um, yield per location, yield per time, yield per month, um, et cetera, these are really valuable data points. And so that's where we're starting um, and you know, where, where we can start today. Um, ultimately, though, the, you know, the future is on building upon that platform because we, we have this, this uh, roving ground robot so we can, you know, plug in sensors and we can plug in computer vision to really grab things around crop quality, uh, health, yield, um, indicators like that, and, and more environmental metrics as well. And so that's really the future. I see. That makes sense. Are there any specialization needed for different types of crops? Or when you say specialty crops, what are the main like types of crops or market you're targeting? Mm. Yeah, that's a great question. So specialty crops um, comprises our you know, fruits, vegetables, uh, nuts, uh, and also horticulture uh, products. So it is not 
your grains, your wheats, your rice, your corn, your soy, um, which oftentimes are the, the Midwest uh, is how we often think about row crops, as it's called. Uh, specialty crops um, largely sit in, in California, um, but you know, they are grown elsewhere as well. And so our you know, first market that we look at is table grapes. 99% um, of table grapes are grown in California. So it's a fantastic market because it's right in our back door and it very much you know, has the problems that we've uh, identified. So in terms of what uh, adaptations would be needed uh, to be made to both you know, the hard hardware piece of it as well as the data um, and software piece of it is one, uh, table grapes itself is a huge problem set uh, to solve for. Um, so we've developed our designs, um, our hardware designs based on uh, how table grape farms are set up. So, you know, we look at apples, we look at peaches, uh, we look at strawberries, right, as really interesting markets as well. Um, but definitely, you know, the some hardware changes would be needed to make to those. But the cool part is, um, on the data and analytical side, uh, that really would just be minor iterations uh, uh, because we would be capturing the same uh, similar pieces of data. I see. So in terms of the hardware changes, um, do you think any sensing suite will also need to change? What kind of sensors are on board now? And are most of them focused on navigation or also specialized to different crops? Yeah, so primarily, um, Right now, it is uh, based on the autonomous navigation. Um, those are the the primary kind of sensing on the the wheelbarrow itself. Right, we have a load and load sensor um, and location as well. Let's see. Cool. And um, what are some other future tools or features you might imagine that carry or other products uh, will interface with the farms? Yeah. Um, so I think, you know, for us, the million dollar question is, do we become the sort of all in one table grape robotic solution? Um, or do we expand into other crops? And I actually don't think it's a binary solution. Uh, for us, we're getting started by solving what we think is the, the biggest problem set um, and the most technologically feasible challenge to solve, which, you know, again, mm -hmm. is what we call this intelligent transport. Um, and part of that, the big problem we have to solve is what is, how do we do ruggedized autonomous navigation across the farm? Um, and so that's really our starting point um, in starting with table grapes. I think the, the second um, piece of that, right, is going to be looking at other types of table grape um, solutions across the harvest value chain. Um, so, you know, for example, um, during a harvesting, right, you need to, you need to weed, you need to seed, uh, you need to harvest, um, right, you need to do all these, you need to pack, you need to, you know, pick, pack, ship. Um, and robotics can play a role in all of those um, pieces of the value chain. Um, for example, I was having a call today around weeding. Right, and, and we know chemical weeding is really bad for the soil. Um, and in this era of you know, increased knowledge and, and interest, thankfully, around regenerative agriculture, it's you know, how do we do things to the land that don't harm it, right? And actually can help it um, in, in mm -hmm. carbon sequestration. So, um, you know, so I think there's, there's that. I think moving into other crops, um, you know, on the on the transportation side, it's going to be a huge need. The labor challenges um, are not going to go away. You know, unfortunately, because of how we've set up, um, you know, migrant workforces and the policies we've put in place, um, uh, you know, we we have to address them, and, and robotics is one of them. I see. Where do you see the future of agriculture field going, and how does that impact the market? Um, amount the food supply, prices, et cetera? Yeah. Um, so I think it's, I think, you know, a few trends that I'm seeing um, and reading and hearing, uh, you know, one is precision agriculture. Um, so, you know, as I mentioned, as we get, understand more data, right? First, the first challenge is capturing the data and then being mm -hmm. able to analyze the data. 
um, you know, we cannot, we can be predictive and prescriptive um, in terms of what happens on the farm. So for example, you know, spot dosing of pesticides. So instead of like this kind of spray and pray approach, um, really being very targeted, right, about where we put um, pesticides on the farm, you know, so that's just, that's just one example. You know, another example is, is being able to analyze, you know, the crop health and quality metrics and being able to predict yields out of that. Um, and then that impacts, you know, the revenue of the farm, right, and things like that. So precision agriculture, I think, is really, really quite exciting. Um, I think we're going to see that coalesce with, as I mentioned, regenerative um, agriculture. Uh, I was just speaking to an organic farmer actually based in the UK um, and really thinking about, you know, how are we running farms in a, in a more organic way and, and even regenerative. And so the, the best ways to do that, right, um, at a scalable level, right, are trying to incorporate um, both small and, and large technologies um, to, to play a role in this. Um, so ultimately, I think, you know, the, these pillars that we think about, right, is one is on the food production side, two is on the farm worker side, and what is the future of work uh, for farms. So I'll mention that trend as, as well. Um, you know, we're, we're working uh, with communities and farm worker communities because uh, we understand, you know, when we talk to migrant farm workers in California, you know, say in and around Fresno, the ki their kids are understandably don't want to do this work. And so the nature of work in, in agriculture is going to change, right? We'll have people who are doing more me uh, mechanics, right? More fixing mm -hmm. of these robots, uh, hopefully maybe renting, right? The equipment and having more ownership uh, over it. So, so I think it's the people side. I think it's the technology side. I think it's climate, right? Um, all converging into, into a lot of different opportunities. Yeah, cool. Um, final question, based on your experience so far, what would you think the, I guess related, what would you think one of the uh, main bottlenecks of all of these vision could be? Is it the technology side or is it the logistics and uh, policy side or, and if you have any thoughts of within the technology, based on your experience with your team, would the effort be more on, for instance, computer vision or uh, controller and optimization, or is it really the data we're still needing right now? Yeah, I think um, that's a great question. I think um, on the challenges side, I, I would say it's capital and technology. Um, mm -hmm. So technology, not that all this technology doesn't exist, right? We've seen robotics mm -hmm. has been around forever. Um, you know, I often just look at manufacturing, right, and see it as a blueprint in many ways for, for what's going to happen on the farm. Um, the challenge, right, with, with agriculture is, you know, we are trying to build military grade equipment, essentially, at ag tech prices. Um, you know, this stuff has to be highly ruggedized. Um, and so it can't, it can't be as delicate as, you know, to be frank, what you see in industrial and indoor applications. And so I think we're, we're absolutely there, um, you know, as an industry, um, but making it commercial and scalable, right, is kind of our is our is our challenge. Um, so that's related to sort of the capital uh, piece of it. Um, I think you know we are having a lot of interest from investors, thankfully, in the food and ag space, um, as well as in the robotic space, and and those you know who care about impact in in general. Um, but to be frank, you know, ag tech isn't some consumer SaaS product, right? It costs money to build these things. The, the timelines are longer. And so, you know, feel grateful that there's a lot of different types of funding mechanisms that we're seeing. We've employed equity crowdfunding, for example. We raised uh, $1.56 million this past October via equity crowdfunding. Um, you know, we're backed by a VC as well, but I think we're going to be really creative, have to be really creative around how capital comes into the industry. Cool. Oh, thank you for your insight. It's very interesting. Of course. Of course. Yeah. We're close to the time, but I'm pretty curious, like, as a final question about um, what are some of your biggest lessons learned on your own uh, entrepreneurial journey or any advice for people who are interested in robotics and entrepreneurship? Yeah, 
Um, this is a big question. Um, I've learned so <laughs> I've learned so many lessons because I've been at it for so long. I, you know, I think one is uh, people. Um, you know, you really. You know, sometimes people think of entrepreneurship uh, because we sort of have this notion in our society that, you know, the solo hero entrepreneur, like the Elon yes. Musk or the Steve Jobs, um, but it's a team sport, um, right? There's some people who are good at storytelling and marketing and, 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 and gaining the notoriety, uh, but it's a team sport. And so um, really talk to as many people as possible as you are building what you want to build, even at a really early stage. Um, perfectionism will kill ideas, will kill execution. Um, so just try to try to, you know, talk to as many people in the way that is most comfortable for you, right? If you don't like face to face, you know, do, you know, see if there's a way you can join communities in, in, in different ways, uh, slacks and, and things like that. Um, I think the second thing is is patience, like especially for all of us here, you know, who are doing hard tech, right, and and building robotics. Um, it's it's a long game, um, and so I think of things honestly in ten year cycles uh, when it comes to these these types of companies. So having patience, which I actually don't have um, in many ways, um, I'm someone who definitely loves to run. Um, but it's a it's a constant learning for me to just try to be patient uh, in the building of these of these solutions and companies. I see. Well, thank you so much, Suma. This was very interesting. Thank you for your time. Yeah. No. Thank you. Appreciate it. And that's the end of today's podcast. But there's plenty more at robohop.org forward slash podcast. And while you're browsing, consider checking out how you could support the RoboHub podcast through our Patreon campaign. As a podcast that's entirely run by volunteers, we rely on really small donations from our listeners to keep us going. The RoboHub podcast will always remain free to listen to, but a monthly donation of as little as a dollar makes a huge difference to us, enabling us to continue to bring you the latest from research labs, events and conferences around the world. So thank you. We'll be back with another episode in about two weeks' time. Until then, goodbye. Farming with Robohub, the podcast for news and views on robotics.